us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory as always, Lord God. We thank you for allowing us to come together. Lord, we thank you for this service that we have today and the chance to fellowship, Lord. We ask that you just pour out that spirit once again, Lord God, in a mighty way that we might be able to receive your word today in a way that is pleasing to you. Give us that spiritual understanding and wisdom that we need, Heavenly Father, in order to make sense out of the Lord God and, and to be able to apply it in our lives. We are grateful, God, for the blood of Jesus, and we just want to give all the thanks in the world. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. It's always a blessing to see everybody out there in here. And uh, as Tony said, we had that good news about the potential for moving the, the, the fellowship and having a, uh, a place where we can meet. I think, honestly, I think we've, we've sort of outgrown uh, Tony's basement for right now. Uh, like I said, Tony and Linda were generous enough to allow us to use this, but I think uh, if we're going to reach more people, if we're going to fulfill God's will for this ministry and this fellowship here, it's time to, to move on. And, and they can have their basement back and, <laughs> and choose to come to worship if they don't want to. <laughs> they can miss a couple of days here and there if they choose to and, you know, not have to do all that. But anyway, I'm sure they'll, I know they'll be there every day, but, you know, it's, they've, they've certainly done us all a, a, a big service by allowing us to come yes. to their home yeah. every single Saturday and and uh, they're just beautiful people, and we're all blessed to be associated with them and have their, their friendship. Yeah. It's just been a blessing. Um, and uh, I think, it, like I said, it's going to give us a chance to reach out a little bit and, and touch some more lives. Um, um, uh, uh, Jamie's husband uh, back there, Ephraim, I'll, I'll tell you, sometimes names just jump right out of my head. Even Ephraim was saying that he wanted to reach out and, 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 and do the Lord's work, you know. Amen. Because uh, he realized that uh, the Spirit's just touched him. The Spirit has touched him, you know, he, he's sanctified at this point. And, and once that Spirit touches you, you know, you're going to want to reach out and fulfill God's will. And, and having said that, the first scripture I'm going to is the book of Genesis. And it's Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And the Lord put it in my spirit to, to touch on that verse first. And, and what it says is, and it says, And the Lord said, God, the Lord God said, and this is back in Genesis now, we're going way back in the beginning. My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Mm -hmm. Now remember, God created man in his own image. And God placed him in the Garden of Eden. And the man and woman were living in bliss. And they had all that they needed. Of course, we know what happened after that. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have control of their own lives. They didn't want to be led and directed by God the Spirit. They wanted to exert their own will. <coughs> And so they ate of the apple of the tree of knowledge or the tree of, of uh, good and evil or knowledge. And they gained the wisdom that God had in the sense that now they could discern good from evil. And they were casted out of the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Now after that, we do know that the, I think uh, the first thing that happened pretty much after that was I think we're told of the story of uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, once again, it's clearly showing the nature of man. And after that, we had the uh, Tower of Babel and all sorts of things going on. But basically, God just said in that one verse, you know, man is flesh. And he doesn't, he can't tolerate man in his flesh form. In fact, he had such an intolerance of man in the flesh <coughs> that he said his days will be numbered 120 years. So don't, let us not, you know, delude ourselves into believing that this flesh that we carry, even though it was created by God, 
this flesh that we carry is something that pleases God. It doesn't please God. And it is constantly challenging God. And God couldn't tolerate it. He couldn't tolerate it to the point that instead of men and women living for 800, 900, or 600 years, he cut the life expectancy down to 120. Mm -hmm. In fact, we all know what happened with the Noah Ark. Ark it went with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, God has purely shown us on numerous occasions that the flesh is not something that he really chooses to be associated with or tolerate on any level. Because it is, a, it is bound to sin all the time. And if we go to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, we see that in the Old Testament, if the Lord chose a man, flesh, for a particular mission, a mission of importance, what he would do, would he would pour out his spirit upon that man. So that now God could use him in a mighty way to do his work. And if you look at that scripture, it's talking about Saul, who was chosen to be the first king of the Jewish nation. And so when God selected Saul, the first thing he had to do after that selection process was, he had to pour out his spirit into Saul. And when you read that scripture, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. This is what the angel was telling Saul. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into, key point, another man. Mm. No, Make no mistake about it, when the Spirit of God is infused or injected into the flesh of a man, this vessel that we carry, this flesh, you become another man, a new man. You are that new creation, and you also get a new heart. So now we have man in the flesh, purely not pleasing to God, in conflict with God. God not able to tolerate man in his fleshly state. However, when God needed to use someone, he would infuse the spirit into them and create them into another man. Of course, we do know that in the Old Testament, Saul, carrying the anointing of the spirit, he lost that anointing. Because he did something that displeased God and he lost the anointing of that spirit. And that's when David took over. So in the Old Testament, you could be anointed with the Holy Spirit and carry God's spirit, but you could also lose it by your actions. And throughout the Old Testament, we were given the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law, and man was shown or sort of given these rules to follow. Mm -hmm. They looked like they were very complicated because man was never able to follow them at all. And that was clear. I mean, it was only ten things that you had to do. But because of the flesh, man is not capable of doing those ten, those ten things. Nor so was man able to accomplish all of the Mosaic laws that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were all about, pretty much in charge of telling people what they could and couldn't do and interpreting the different laws and and giving them the correct language to follow the law by. But it was clearly evident that man, because of his flesh, could not please God and could not even follow the means by which one could actually obtain the blessings of God or be pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. So we were shown throughout that time that man is not able, as long as he carries this flesh, he cannot earn God's pleasure. He cannot earn God's grace or blessing because he has this flesh. And even when God anointed man with the spirit, he was capable of losing that spirit because of his actions. After that, we go to Psalm verse... 51, excuse me, Psalm chapter or uh, Psalm 51, verse 17. 
And here's where we see how we can actually now, in spite of our flesh, get God's attention and actually please Him in a way. And what that verse says is, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Now man's spirit, we all know that the last time I gave a sermon, we all know that man is not born with a spirit in the sense that we know it. He is spiritually dead. But when you talk about the spirit of man, you're talking about his will, his ego, that part of us that makes us push and strive and work real hard and when we fall down, we'll get back up. That's our will our spirit. And we know that a lot of times when we're out in the world, we do have an addiction to the world. We love the world and we love all the trappings of the world, mm -hmm. all of the amenities of the world, as Linda was telling me today. We're all caught up into that because we carry this flesh. And we've been carrying it since we were youngsters from the womb. And now, you know, after we get to a certain age, depending on when we might hear this word, and if we become, you know, we accept Jesus as our, as our Lord and Savior, but sometimes it takes a long time to get to that point. So we carry that addiction with the world, and we're very much enthralled with the world and captivated by it. But God said that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. That means that the world that we're so addicted to, that we're so caught up into, it has a way of breaking us down and demoralizing us and getting us to the point where our will just isn't as strong as it used to be. In fact, our will has been broken because we essentially get to a point where we do what? We give up. The world has won. It has beaten us down and we give up. Yeah. But guess what? That's a sacrifice that God likes. That's a broken spirit. He loves that sacrifice when you give up your will, your spirit, because now God can enter into your life and get to doing His work. And God also likes a broken and contrite heart. Broken meaning destroyed, broken. Everyone knows what a broken heart when you're in love, you die, you know, broken heart. And contrite means that you're remorseful. You realize that you did something wrong. <laughs> you may not know exactly what it was you did wrong, but you know you did something wrong. And your heart is broken, your spirit is broken, because you have the Ten Commandments in your mind, the back of your mind. You know the difference between good and evil. But now your heart is contrite. These, O oh God, you will not despise. That's the rest of the scripture. These, O oh God, you will not despise. A broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. God doesn't despise that coming from the flesh of man. Because at that point, when you have that, now God can actually get to work with you. Because now you're ready. You're ready to receive the Lord. Because the flesh, the compass, the engine, the motor of the flesh, the spirit, the will has been broken. And the heart is also broken. And you're empty. And you're devoid. And now you're ready to fill up with something else maybe. Maybe not. But God is ready now to work with you. So when you go to scripture 3, excuse me, the third scripture I want to talk about is when Jesus came, he didn't come for the people who were doing well and who were successful. He came for the people who had these broken spirits and broken hearts. He came for the people that the world had cast away, the throwaways, the ones that society and the world didn't want to have anything to do with, or the ones that society and the world had said were not quality people, mm -hmm. were not good people, were not the people that you would aspire to be. These are the people that Jesus came for. And when he came to those people, it's interesting. I always looked at the Beatitudes. And I would read the Beatitudes. And I would wonder, how in God's creation can I do some of those things that God wants us to do? 
Well, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus came not only to give us that message of, of salvation, but he also came to fulfill the Old Testament in respect to the law, to the to the uh, Ten Commandments and Mosaic Law. Okay? Fulfilling means to bring it to its conclusion. Mm -hmm. Bring it to its ending. Okay? And then he goes on to tell us that, guess what? It's not just not murdering your brother or not committing adultery. There's more to the actual commandments than just doing that. And you guys couldn't even do that. But guess what? There's more to it. Because he tells us in Matthew 5, 21, 23. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But Jesus said, I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, not just murder your brother, but actually angry with your brother without a cause, shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Rocco, which, which is a, a, a word of contentment, you means that you despise the person, shall be in danger of counsel. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So really with that scripture, he took the Ten Commandments, which no one with the flesh could actually fulfill, and took it to a whole nother level. He said it's not just committing murder, it's actually, you know, being angry at someone. You know, thinking, admonishing someone, holding someone in contempt. He goes on to say, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. This is Matthew 5, 27, 29. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery of her in his heart. Mm -hmm. Well, he took that whole adultery thing to a whole nother level. He's, I mean, you don't even have to commit the act. Just thinking about it is a sin. And I would say to myself, and then we have the other one, uh, Turning the other cheek. I didn't even write that one down. We all know about that one. Yeah. You know? You can go on and on and on and on. But my point is this. Jesus took that bar of the Ten Commandments and took it to a whole nother level. Because mm -hmm. it's not just what you do, it's what you think. And I often ask myself, how in God's creation can we ever think to do that? John chapter 3, verse 5 and 7, Jesus answered to the people, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I repeat, unless one is not born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And then he said, do not marvel that I said, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Well, here we go. You have to be born again. You can't walk around in the flesh and think that you will be pleasing to God. You have to be born again in the spirit of Christ. To actually enter the kingdom of God. John 4, 23, 24. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. We are called to worship God in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a second. This all makes sense now. If we have to be born again to enter the kingdom of God, that means that we have to be what? What, what happened when the spirit in the Old Testament was launched into someone? They became another man with a new heart. 
So when we become born again, it's not when we become born again. If we are truly born again, we are a new creation with a new heart. Meaning that we have, as I always say, died to our flesh. We have, you know, in the water, meaning that when you are baptized, you go into the water and the flesh is laid in the water. And when you come out of the water, you are now that new creation. You are now the spirit of Christ. You are born again. And it's only through that spirit of Christ that we now are, that we can now truly worship God as that living sacrifice that he wants in order to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. And we, we are that spirit of Christ. The Beatitudes are now accomplished. If you've got the spirit of Christ and you're not with the flesh, you will not be thinking about committing adultery. You will not be angry at your fellow man. If someone asks, you will give. It's only because of our addiction to the world and our habit of living with the flesh and the behaviors that we have done over and over and over and over again that we quench that spirit and we fall back into our flesh. And I will tell you, we do it over and over and over again every single day. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We just do. And it takes a while before you're even aware. When you're falling back into that trap of relying on the flesh. Because when you go to Romans 13 and 14. Well, go to Romans 14, verse 3, I think it is. Or the end, no, excuse me. Romans uh, chapter 13, verse 14, and then Romans 14, 3. It says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. Key word. Make no provisions for the flesh. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't even make provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Mm -hmm. And the point is that they were arguing about the, the meat that had been sacrificed to the, uh, uh, <coughs> not to idols, but possibly to idols, okay, or, or what have you. It could even maybe have been in a sacrifice to idols. And people were saying, well, could you take that meat and eat it? And some people were saying, well, no, you can't take that meat. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, they would eat vegetables. Other people were hungry. They had no food. <laughs> you know, they needed that meat in order to survive, so they would eat it. And what they're saying is, is that for the one who believes... He may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. If I'm going to sit there and with my flesh start talking about the rules, the commandments, the things you can and can't do, and I'm going to start telling you, well, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, but you can't do that, you can't do that. What is talking right there? Flesh. That's the flesh. Mm -hmm. You're right back with the flesh. And you think that you're working in the Spirit because you're quoting what the Scripture in the Bible says you should be doing. Right. But you're not. You're just back with the flesh because you're still thinking that you're going to earn God's approval. You're going to please Him by doing the right thing. But the key word in there is you. You are going to please Him. You are going to earn His approval. 
It's all, it, it's going back to you. That's the ego, that's the flesh. Mm. And that's not what we're talking about. When you're in the spirit of Christ, you don't have to worry about the rules. You don't have to quote all the commandments. You don't have to sit and think about it. Because you're functioning from the spirit of Christ and you're going to be doing the right thing all the time. Mm. How do you get to that point? You get to that point through faith. You believe so strongly in the Lord Jesus Christ and you trust what he said so much that your faith tells you it's the way to do it and you do it. And I'm going to tell you right now, the only way you can really do it, you've got to do, you've got to be able to stay in the moment. Mm -hmm. You can't have the spirit of Christ and jump out of the moment. And what I mean by the moment is the present. You can do it if you stay in the moment and you stay, you know, in the present. As soon as you let your mind drift to the past, thinking about, you know, what somebody did or what you did the other day, or you just start dwelling in the past, your mind, you're out of the moment. I guarantee you, you're going to tap into something about the flesh, and you're going to lose the spirit. If you start looking into the future and jump out of the moment, you're going to start making plans, your plans. You're going to start worrying, and you Spirit's going to jump right out of you. You're out of, it. You're out of it. We have got to have faith and know that through our faith, all we need to do is to die every morning and wake up and pray for that anointing, believe in that anointing, and then stay in the moment every moment of the day. And the Spirit will take us wherever we need to go. We don't have to worry about our job. We don't have to worry about how we're going to do it. We don't have to worry about how much money we're going to make that day. We don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about anything. All we have to do is have faith, trust in that spirit, let that spirit take over, and then the spirit is going to do everything that needs to be done. And as soon as you stand up and make an objection to that, well, what if? As soon as you let the what if come in, you don't get it. You don't get it. And you're out of the spirit. Mm -hmm. You've quenched it. It's gone. Now, they do tell us, you know, how you know. And that's the nice thing about having the Ten Commandments and, and having the scripture. You can tell when you're being led by the flesh. Because it tells us in Ephesians, well, it's all over the Bible, and I'll take Ephesians 4.23. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in two righteousness and holiness. No, no corrupt word, and this is verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. For what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Well, you know, if you want to think about where are you... Because we all have a conscious mind. You know, we can, some of us can do two things at one time. You're in the spirit. But then you can see what you're doing. You can be aware of what you're saying. If you're not being tender-hearted, forgiving one another, 
if you're not, you know, having fellowship with, or not having fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, and you're not exposing them, then you're not in the Spirit. And I know everyone in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's not that hard to figure out. But it's our flesh that wants to hold us. You know, and I think a lot of us start to think that it's the flesh with the spirit and it's the two combined that somehow make us pleasing to God, you know, and empowers us to do all of these great things. Mm -hmm. It's the two of us working together. It's not a partnership. The flesh and the spirit are not a partnership. They're in conflict with one another. It's not a partnership. That's right. You've got to just let that flesh go, open up to that spirit, and stay in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's the freedom that we have in the spirit of Christ. Our freedom comes from releasing ourselves of the flesh, being born again in the spirit of Christ, not quenching that spirit, and the spirit now just takes over and we stay in the moment. And we don't have to worry about anything. We don't have to think about anything. We don't even have to do anything. We can shut down. And that's the hardest part. But we shut down. And the spirit takes over. And that's how this whole thing started. Because we read Romans chapter 14. Last week. Last week. And it was interesting because, like I said, the people that get all caught up in the rules, you know, they're the ones whose faith is weak. Because we don't have to sit here and tell everyone what to do. Amen. And what's right and wrong. Right. If we're in the spirit, we're going to do what's right. That's our freedom. And if we see something about it doing something wrong, we're going to know what to do. Mm -hmm. We might at times have to admonish. We might at times rebuke. But at the same token, the Spirit will tell us what it is we need to do. And it's going to be done in love. It's not going to be any anger associated with it. It's not going to be any anxiety associated with it. It's going to be done in love. And love is stronger than fear. Mm -hmm. That's how you rid yourself of fear. You get to understand it and grab a hold of that love of Christ. And get that Spirit of Christ inside of you. And now you, you're filled with love. And you don't have any fear. Because of that love of Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Greg. You're welcome.